So, Peter, your investing philosophy is often summed up as buy what you know. And there's some truth to that, and it's also often way oversimplified. Sure. Can you explain what you did mean by that and, sure, and what you sure. didn't mean? Well, I, it bothers me that people are, are very dangerous when they invest. This word, play the market, that's a dangerous term. But if you do some work, do some research, know what you own, look at the, research, look at the balance sheet, you, if you could add 8 and 8, get fairly close to 16, you find out this company has lots of debt, no cash, they're in trouble. You shouldn't own it. So a little bit of research. People are careful when they buy a refrigerator. They're careful when they take a vacation. And they, they'll put five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 some stock to hear on the bus or at a party. That's dangerous. So when you say buy what you know, you also thought that the regular investor might be able to get an, an inside right. advantage right. by sticking to an industry right. he's familiar right. with or seeing something right. that she realizes is a great right. product. I'm, imagine if you were in a mall the last 50 years. You would have seen Gap when it was hot. You would have seen Limited when it was hot. You would have seen when it was not hot. You would have seen when they were starting, people weren't excited about Gap anymore. Or, or, and then you do some research and say, well, gee, there's a lot of limited stores, but we're only at 20. You know, they can go to 400. So you, you, you see a company. I did really well at Dunkin' Donuts, a local company. I did well at Stop and Shop. But people could see that this is really some people showing up. Or I guess the Sunglass Hut, no one's there anymore. So I mean, that's research. That's fundamentals. So in, but you don't leave the mall, though, and buy that day. You, <laughs> you have to do some more work. That's the important point. Yeah. So today, uh, there's so much information everywhere, information overload. Does that make it harder for active investors? The indexers say everyone's got access to the same information at the same time. You can't beat the market. Well, the way you beat the index is you, you avoid the stocks to go down. You avoid the steel companies and the oil companies and Sears and Penny and where the companies are deteriorated. I mean, companies are dynamic. The, the, behind every stock, there's a company. These are not lottery tickets. So we, you're trying to find the companies within the S&P 500 that are doing better. They're going from crappy to semi-crappy to good. That might take a couple of years. Or they're going to grow for a long time. And you're trying to avoid the companies that are going south. That's how you beat them. Or you find some companies outside the S&P 500 that are, that are Great companies, CarMax was not in the S&P 500, they went up 200-fold. So a lot of companies that enter, and a lot of their great performances before they go in. Now, a lot of people, when they're lucky enough or smart enough to get a company that's going up, they then they take their profits. Right. And, and you made the case in a book that you should actually hang in there with the really great stocks, and you even got a call from Warren Buffett as a result. Yeah, in 1989, I'm at home, and the phone rings, and I thought it was one of my friends, but one of my daughters, I think it was six-year-old, Annie picked up and said, she kissed, there's a Mr. Buffett online? I said, this has got to be a joke. So I pick it up and, this, this Warren Buffett, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, you know, I read your book, my end report's doing two weeks, can I use the line? He said that all in about seven seconds. <laughs> and I said, that's great, I'd love to do it. What, you know, what's the line? He said, I love this, it's been waiting to do this. When you sell your great companies and add to the losers, it's like water in the weeds and cutting the flowers. And he said, I want to put it in. And he said, if you ever come to Nebraska, you don't call me, your name will be mud all over Nebraska. So did he call him? Oh, yeah. I've several times we play bridge together. We've had several meetings. Great guy. Another point you've made, and this is, I think, particularly relevant 10 years into a bull market, is that I think you said more money has been lost anticipating a downturn than actually in the downturn. Can you explain? Well, obviously, the market's, market's gone up tenfold since I stopped running Magellan. So you make more money on the upside. The market's going to be a lot higher in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Trying to predict the market is really a waste. It, I don't know what it's going to do. It can go down. The, the, when I ran Magellan, 13 years, it declined 10% or more, nine times the market. Wow. I had a perfect record. I went down more than 10% every time. Whatever the market went down, I went down more. But over the long term, the upside is more than the downside. So you've got to say to yourself, do I need the money in the next month? Do I need the money in the next year? Do I have kids going to college? Do I have a wedding coming up? Then you're a bad investor. If you, if, you, if you can keep putting money in, you have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 year, you should do well. One thing we're thinking a lot about at Barron's is the secular changes we're seeing in the market, mm -hmm. where there's so much disruption that we wonder if certain industries, they may be cheap and they may just keep on getting cheaper. I mean, retail would be an obvious right, one right. in some cases, victims of Amazon. But even the auto industry, very low right. price earnings multiples. Maybe right. the market sees something. Right. How, do you think secular changes is moving more rapidly now than it did in the 80s when you were running money? No, I saw the textile industry deteriorate. I, I was recommending all the stocks on the way down. I saw the shoe industry go away. Industries, are, it, it, industries can go from terrific to terrible. There's a great expression in the textile industry that helped me a lot. Textile industry, yeah. 
It's always darkest before pitch black. <laughs> just when think things are terrible, they get terrible squared. I mean, so just because industries are getting bad, that's not a reason best. Wait for things to get better. Because again, somebody might be involved in something. They might be involved in coal. They might be involved in iron ore. They might be involved in plastics. They'll see it aluminum pick up before I do. So you might, that's a cyclical turnaround. That might last two or three years. You might see it way before Wall Street sees it. One broad area that you've recently said might be interesting is energy, and it's very unloved on Wall Street right now. Uh, what do you see in there? Well, the difference between a glut right now and a shortage is like one million barrels a day. You know, the world consumes 100 million barrels a day, one million each way. So if the economy stays okay, and these shale wells, you do 1,000 barrels a day the first month, a year later, they're 300. Wow. And then they're 150. Big drop off. It's a real treadmill. And right now, there's no private equity money, there's no IPOs, there's no bond market, the banks want out, private equity wants out. Shale's going to slow down. So these people think that shale's going to keep growing two, three million barrels a day. We've gone from five million barrels in the U.S. producing to 12 and a half. People think that's going to continue. I don't believe it will. Peter Lynch, thank you very much.